courtesy of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the regular season is upon us, and I'm Dan alongside Matt. Matt, we got lots of roster moves to talk about today, and we're going to be playing our prediction game. We'll see if either of us can actually do well this year. Yeah, the, today is waiver day across the NHL as teams are in a desperate rush to get cap compliant and all that by tomorrow at the 7th at 3 p.m. Mountain Time. And uh, a lot of the players making the cut and a lot of players not so much. Well, let's talk about where the Flames roster is at. The Calgary Flames, as of uh, after, I guess, waiver time today, have 24 players remaining on the roster. They have to get down to 23 by tomorrow or when everyone hears this, probably today, um, by Monday the 7th at 3 p.m. Right now, the Flames have eight defensemen, 14 forwards, and two goalies on the roster. The eight defensemen include Tyson Berry, who got signed. You and I are not surprised by that. We've been talking about that. 14 forwards remain. We'll talk about the guys that don't in a second. But there's currently three forwards that are able to be sent down and don't need to clear waivers. Those are Sam Honzig, Matt Coronado, and Adam Klapka. One of them will need to be sent down to be compliant. Who do you think it is? Matt Coronado. You think so? Yep. You don't think it's Honzig? No, I think he made the team. and I Just based on like overall game performance against NHL players, Hanzik was clearly the better player of the two. I don't know if Hanzik stays here, but I think he at least gets a game or two. Yeah, it's one of those where you have to reward players who actually show up and take a spot. And Hanzik, he took a spot. And Coronado, he started hot against players that weren't necessarily NHL caliber. And as the competition got a little stronger... Coronado kind of faded into the background and was not really noticeable in the last couple of games he played. Uh, so I, I would lend more to moving Coronado down for uh, the first few weeks or months of the season. Coronado looked good against young players when we started to see more veteran lineups, I think is when he started to disappear. Yeah, and he needs to learn how to make those adjustments and basically be the best guy on the Wranglers and, you know, score a ton of goals and know where he needs to be to fight for the pucks properly. And it's just not quite getting there yet in his game. But he, you can tell he's close. It's just, you know, it's a matter of being a like a third of a step behind in a certain situations, not quite being in the right spots, which that's just a matter of time. And the best way to learn that is not playing on the third or fourth line in the NHL. It's playing first line minutes in the American League. Yeah, like tearing that league a new one and, you know, being one of the best players in the AHL and forcing your way back up. I think you're right there. I think Adam Klapka will stay. I think Klapka will probably be a regular on the fourth line. Uh, we've talked a lot about taking that Walker Dewar spot. I'm not at all surprised that Walker Dewar got sent down or not claimed, but I think that. Uh, Klapka at least, you know, starts in that role, wearing number 43 for the Flames this year. He's well, shown that and, he can do it. Yeah, and you see, like, how Pospisil plays, and Klapka has learned a lot from uh, Pospisil, and, it, like, they both play that grindy, agitating, I'm big, you're not, smash <laughs> kind of a game, and... Yeah. And yeah. Klapka and Lomberg together, I like that idea. Yes, we have an averagely sized fourth line. Yep. Yeah, two small guys. Kevin Rooney, I guess. I don't know what size he is, but... He's around six foot, so... Okay. So, together, if you put three of them together with a trench coat, they go on a ride at the amusement park. Yep. Um, yeah, but I mean, it, it's a good... It's been a long time, so we've had a really good agitation fourth line. Like, you know, we talk a lot about the energy line, and I think this is going to be a tough line to play against and bring some real sandpaper there. I don't know if Klapka will stay here all year just because of the waiver status. I could see him uh, going back down at some point, but you at least have to, like we were talking about with Hanzig, I think both those guys, you at least have to start them here and see what they've got. Yeah, and you want to have your team being hard to play against. Like We might lose games, but you don't want teams going, oh, this team's a pushover. You know, you want guys getting upset with Klapka and uh, Lomberg and Pospisil and whomever else mucking it up and, you know, making life difficult for them. And, you know, the more that those guys can, you know, show their, 
game, uh, you know, it gives the Flames an identity of, like, yeah, we might not be the best team, but, you know, you're going to have to come in and earn those two points. It's not going to be any freebies walking in onto our building. I agree. Yeah. Uh, where do you put Hanzig in the lineup? Like, to put him in, you got to take somebody out. I don't think he's a centerman. No, I think uh, for now, because Igor Sharangovich uh, got hurt in the Winnipeg game and is, you know, like there's no status on him for the foreseeable future, I would kind of just slot him into Sharangovich's spot for now. And, you know, he he's primarily playing on a scoring line. Throw him out there. Uh, it's expected Sharon Govich to be playing with Kuzmenko and Kadri. Yeah, so I would throw Hanzik on that line, and well, See does. you know, you, you've shown well in the preseason that you can make passes to the good players that are on your line, and you can make space for yourself. Here's a prime opportunity. You're getting to play with two first line players. Let's have fun. Yeah, no, I think you're right, and I think Hanzik may only last here as long as. You know, Sharon Govich is out unless he can take somebody else's job. But when I look at this team, I don't see where you keep him here long term. I think he's starting here because there could be that injury. For sure. And it's one of those that, you know, you have to have a kids audition in the NHL as we're going through this retool. And usually players play well for the first eight or 10 games when they're fresh out and then they tar- start to slide. And if, say, Sharon Govich misses a couple weeks, that's about the right timeline for Hanzik to start slowing down. So, you know, and you want to give guys like that the runway where if they take the spot and they keep it like Connor Zari and Marty Pospisil last year, fine. Okay, we can, you know, move Rooney out of the lineup or, you know, send down somebody else. It's, you know... It's one of those yeah, where give, give him the spot, and I and I think as long as Hansi keeps doing what he's been doing at the NHL level, when he does get sent to the American League, I think that they will he'll be the call up when somebody's traded. And I mean, we know you know Mantha will be traded. We're pretty sure that Kuzmenko will be traded. Like I think as soon as one of those guys gets traded, I think he'll be the the first guy they look at to bring up for the rest of the season. Yeah, for sure. And it, it's one of those where you. With a rebuild and retool, you have to give guys the right runway. And like if they're saying, I'm great great and ready now, and then they continue to show that game in and game out, okay, fine, awesome, cool. <laughs> you know, you're forcing us to make other moves. Oh, no. You know. Yeah, and, you know, and I do want to caution fans, too. I mean, yes, Hanzig looked good during the preseason, that doesn't necessarily mean that that will continue. And I think that this is a good way to see how does he do in an NHL lineup against NHL players. Um, you know, and maybe he, you know, I'm not saying it looks bad, but maybe it just looks like sort of like we we're talking about with Coronado. You know, when other guys come back and there's really no room, do you stick him on the fourth line or is he going to develop better in the American League, you know, playing first line minutes with Coronado? And being in the AHL is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, there's a lot of great development you can have by playing first line minutes in the American League that you're not going to get necessarily playing, you know, fourth line minutes in the, in the NHL. Yeah. And if he gets sent down, say, at the beginning of November, then he will know what it takes to get back up here and work on those things in the AHL. Exactly. Yep. Um, going to the back end, it looks like the Flames start the season with eight defensemen. And if we take a look at the eight defensemen, I'm I'm kind of surprised that they're starting with eight D. I mean, they I think they could have avoided We'll, we'll talk about the the waiver move in a little bit here with Jacob Peltier, but I think they could have avoided that by not carrying AD. I don't know you need AD at this point. They have Uyghur, Anderson, Bean, Barry, Miramanov, Ball, Hanley, Pakal. I would have, I think, at this point, waived Hanley. Yeah, I'm a little bit... How would you say? With Peltier, he played rather poorly, uh overall like his shot and his passing was not very good like his defensive positioning was perfectly fine but in order to be an NHL player you have to be able to shoot and pass the puck effectively and he really didn't show any of that in the games that he played and like as much as it's uh let's just let's just pause there and preface this conversation for listeners so for those that don't know the Flames made their final waiver 
moves. They put Peltier, Schwint, and Cooley on waivers. You and I have been talking about what that would happen. So just wanted to, to give some context there. A lot of people surprised Peltier was on waivers. And it's one of those where it is a meritocracy. And, like, yes, the Flames could have moved a veteran player, but, like, Peltier was a D player in uh, the preseason. Like, he was near the bottom of the guys that consistently played. And, you know, you as much as, like, you, you're wanting to reward guys like Hanzik, it also sends a bad message to all of the guys in the system. If just because you're a first rounder, you stick around. Yeah, and it's like you simply weren't good enough to make the NHL this uh, out of camp. Yeah. And if somebody else claims you, that sucks that we're losing the former first rounder. But really, you know, organizationally, the one area where the Flames are extremely flush in is winger prospects. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like when you have like Matt Vagardine, um, at Andrew Basha, um, Sunayev, Hanzig, Coronado, like you're easily able to take Peltier's spot and give it to one of the other elite prospects that we have. Does it suck that it doesn't work out if Peltier moves on? Yes, of course. And just like we were disappointed when Balamaki didn't work out. I was about to use that as my comparison here. I mean, Yusuf Valimaki, another high pick for the Flames that they lost on waivers to the old Phoenix Coyotes, now Utah Hockey Club. Fans were really upset at that point. I mean, you know, they, they looked at as, well, they're losing a young asset. But, I mean, he's not become a top four guy in this league either. I think. No, he's been basically the uh, equivalent of Pahal or Miramanov, like, you know, a filler depth defenseman in the NHL. And, while those are useful, we literally replaced them with other guys like Jake Bean is another guy that's in that same general exactly, yep. category. Like, you know, you can go get those guys at UFA for like two million bucks or less. Like, who cares? And I think, you know, well, and even Pakal, I mean, he's 25, you know, like still a young defenseman there. You know, we've got Ball at 24. Like we've got some other young D-men that might be able to replace that. But, you know, when I look at this, yes, it would suck to say lose that first overall asset for nothing. But then I also look at some guys that have come in like Sam Morton, who really was a free acquisition. The Flames signed him as a, you know, as a young player out of college and didn't you know didn't use a draft pick didn't use an asset to get him so i think morton could project to where let's be honest where pelty is probably projecting which is a bottom six winger so even if you lose one asset if you get the free asset in my mind it kind of evens out yeah and it, it's not like the flames also like organizationally don't have winger prospects like between that and defensemen like the flames are good it, and yeah. you know like yes it sucks to lose one but also okay we have like eight other guys that can fight for the same spots who cares like uh, you know it, it sucks and you don't like losing things for nothing but mm -hmm. at the same rate you know like do you sub out Klapka who's looking really good as a fourth line energy guy for somebody who's not really looking like he can shoot or yeah. pass the puck well it, what does your gut tell you is does he get claimed probably not so remember and we've talked about this before but just for any listeners who forgot or knew if you claim a player off waivers they have to stay on the claiming team's nhl roster for the season if that team decides to waive them we Calgary have the first, first pri yeah first right to take that guy back and then if not he goes back on waivers and looking at rosters here I can't see a team that would be comfortable. I mean, yes, he's cheap, but I can't see a team that really says we need this guy on our roster. No, and I'm sure that like everybody's kind of scouting guys that are on the bubble like Peltier around the league and saw how he played and is like, yeah, that's not very good. And and when I look at the list of waiver like forwards on waivers today, if I was looking for some forward depth, there's a lot of other names I'd be looking to. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, look, yeah, I mean, we won't, you know, go through them all yet. We'll talk about that in a minute here. But, you know, guys that I'm looking around going, you know what, there's even if they're not as good, I think there's more known commodities there. Yes. And like that's not to write Peltier off as a player or a prospect, but like he needs to have some time, like another full season to 
reestablish his game. And, you know, it, it shoulder injuries, especially yeah. having two of them, like, we saw Monaghan when his hip problems and, like, he was terrible for a while, then had the surgeries, got better, after, but, like, it took him, like, another year or two to actually become himself again. And, you know, like, Peltier, you know, a year from now might be an NHL player again, but it for, like, the player that he is right now, like, there are several guys that are ahead of him. And even if he's an NHL player, I don't think he's really anywhere a top six forward. No. Right? So I think if we look at that, I mean, I think Coronado at this point has a bigger upside than Peltier. I think Hanzig has a bigger upside than Peltier. I think, you know, Sam Morton has a bigger upside than Peltier. I think there's a number of forwards there um, that, you know, if I'm looking to, let's say we move on from Mantha, and we're looking to fill that spot. And there's other guys you'd go to first, unless Peltier really, you know, tears it up in the American League. But as the depth chart sits right now, I think that, you know, yes, it's sad to lose that asset. But I think, you know, you mentioned Yuso Valamaki as a great example. It hurt at the time. Nobody's thought of him since. No. And it's not like every day we sit in Flames fans and go, ah, Valamaki, the one that got away. No. Like, and. You know, like every once in a while you have like a Marty St. Louis situation where like one actually did get away, but like that's not the case here. And it's not like he was showing oodles of skill during the preseason and he got cut anyway. Like he looked like a the 13th forward, frankly, on, a, you know, even the 14th forward. Mm -hmm. I mean, he looks like he needs to play in the American League, right? And. I hope he gets that chance where, you know, here somewhere else. And just remember that just because he goes away doesn't mean he's gone forever. I mean, you know, maybe he goes somewhere. Maybe, you know, it doesn't work out there. Maybe he's on, what, a one-year deal? Like, maybe he re-signs here in the offseason and, you know, goes to the American League then. Is Like, I, I, I just, if you like this player, I don't think he's necessarily gone and he's going to haunt the Flames. No. And realistically, like, if he gets on waivers again, if he gets claimed, then, you know, Calgary definitely has the first right to take him back. So, yeah, I think the other thing here to remember is this was not this general manager's pick, right? This is the last general manager. And I think if true living was still here, you might have seen a different result because GMs tend to like their own picks. Um, but I think the fact that this was not Connie's pick. I think really, you know, I think you can evaluate it more objectively. Yeah. And also players that suffer serious injuries, you know, like we've seen in the, like our own team's history, like Daniel Kachuk, where he looked like he was going to be a surefire top six forward. And then he got a concussion and was never the same. And things like that happen where, you know, like Peltier did look like he was going to be a good middle six forward, but that shoulder injury, the first one, and then the second one, you know, like that might change his trajectory permanently. And, you know, things like that do happen and it's awful when it does, but, you know, that's we, also life. We as fans tend to overvalue our own pieces. You know, we tend to think our prospects, I think, are better than they are a lot of times. This is going to let us see what is Peltier. Is somebody else willing to take a shot on him, to take him for free? And if they do, maybe he is an NHLer. If not, I think that says something to the fan base here too, that 31 other teams passed on this guy. And, you know, maybe, you know, maybe he doesn't need that time. Maybe he's not as ready as some people think he is. Yep. Um, the other two guys on waivers, Schwint and Cooley, either one of them surprise you? Not really. Um, Cooley, I think, was signed to be the AHL starter. He just had a he pretty was. decent uh, preseason. And, you know, he, he might be found money if he has a really good season in the A, but it's no r rush. And, you know, a couple of good preseason games does not make an NHL goaltender. No. And really, I mean, he had to supplant Vladar or Wolf, which he didn't. Yeah. And, you know, I was worried a little bit last week. I thought, he's going to go on waivers. We know he's going down. Like you said, he was brought in to be an NHL guy. But somebody might look at him and go, geez, we need an NHL goalie. Let's take him. But when I look at who's actually available, Cooley would not be my first choice. No, and, like, a guy like James Reimer would be... Phoenix Copley. 
Yeah, like if you're a team like Anaheim who's having goaltending issues, like those guys are proven like they can actually start 30, 40 games for you without an issue where Cooley's only played in six games in the NHL with a very terrible San Jose team. So, you know, like if you're actually needing a goaltender, there are very much more reliable options for you. Yeah, even even if you're just looking for like a, you know, such an American League goaltender, because again, you got to take him. I could see a guy get taken and waived, but again, but yeah, I, I think that there's better options out there and that makes me feel a little bit better as a Flames fan. Yeah. I mean, I could even see in the right scenario somebody taking a shot at Matt Murray. Yeah, and you know, and with uh, Cole Schwint, he just hasn't shown enough yet that he is a full time NHLer. No, nope. and I thought he might make the team because they need a centerman. But um, with Rooney playing as well as he has, like he is not the when we first signed him, Kevin Rooney. Um, he's looking more like he was with the Rangers and the Devils. So um, that's more than fine as your fourth line center and. Um, you know, it, it's one of those where Schwint needs to w- develop into an NHL player, and he's not, he's kind of getting to the point where he's a little bit too good for the A, but not quite there for the NHL. So he needs to take that next step if he's going to make it. I agree. Looking at the list of guys, though, and uh, fans can look it up if they want to, or listeners, um, there are some interesting names I thought might be worth the Calgary Flames taking a swing at on waivers. We Last year, we saw them pick up A.J. Greer on waivers, and I think that there's some guys here where you might say, you know what, if we need a number 13 or number 14 forward, because I think we're good for defense, maybe it'd be worth bringing in a more veteran guy. So I'll talk about the veteran guys I'm thinking of here, potentially. I think they still need like an extra center. They they don't even have enough centers as it is. And three centers I thought might be interesting. Um, one of them is from Boston, Patrick Brown. He's a 32-year-old, so you'd be bringing him in, you know, sort of for that veteran presence. Last year, he played 11 games and had one point, 32 points in 42 games for Providence. Um, but again, a guy who I think could step in you know, in an emergency, in a in an injury scenario, and be okay. Yeah, and if the flame, I think that would be a situation where if the flames claimed him, they'd probably put him right on waivers and try to sneak him down to the farm. Um, but it, it's one of those. I think at that point you'd probably wave Hanley and keep uh, keep Brown on in the NHL. Yeah, because you don't need AD. Yeah, it, it's one of those where. It's not enough of like it, it. It'd be different if like the Flames actually had an injury to one of the centers, mm-hmm. um, that you would just uh, slot that guy in temporarily as like your fourth line guy. But with I'm just kind of thinking, not even the fourth line guy, but almost the Michael Stone of the forwards, like the the reliable veteran guy, because you don't want a you know you don't want a guy like um, Hanzig to be sitting on the bench. You don't want you know. Coronado to be sitting in the press box. So I'm thinking just a guy you can bring in to be your extra forward who you know can do the job for a game or two when you've got somebody out. Adam Gaudette, uh, another centerman, last year played uh, two games in the NHL and 64 in the AHL, got 71 uh, points in 67 games. And Zachary Anton Reese, another guy, again, played last year. uh, Detroit, three games, had no points, but a guy who's been around for a while. And Matt, I'll give you the one I think is the most interesting. Centerman Ryan Suzuki, I was surprised to see on waivers. He uh, has really not played in the NHL yet. He's 23. But again, if you're just kind of looking for a a centerman who might develop into something, I still think there might be some there with Suzuki. Yeah, and if the Flames needed an NHL center right now, I think that that, any of those would be a good option. I just don't know. Uh, especially with having 14 forwards already that, you know, you necessarily need to get another guy and like send Hanzik or Klapka down just to, you know, have that like to, veteran to me, guy. I would, I would probably keep in that case, I'd probably keep Klapka, send Coronado and Hanzik down. Cause I still think that they both need some NHL experience and then pick up another veteran NHLer. Yeah. Or not even veteran NHLer, but like an older guy who, who knows what it takes to go from the HL and NHL and can be that that extra guy? And if he, you know, if he doesn't look great, you're kind of hoping a kid will pass him. Yeah, the Jared Tenorti of the forward group, basically. There you go. Yeah, 
Um, so just some interesting names that were on waivers there that I thought might be worth looking at. Um, if I would say if the Flames lose Peltier, like it's almost too bad you can't put in a conditional pick and say if we lose this guy, we'll take this guy. I think almost trading one 23-year-old for another in Suzuki might be an interesting move. Yeah, uh, I'm not overly concerned one way or the other. Like the Flames, I, I feel like they have enough veteran talent in the lineup generally anyway that – the urgency really isn't there uh like in past years like getting greer for example like that made sense because like the young guys weren't ready um to start the year so getting an energy guy like greer in made sense but you know like right now as the the organization sets i think we're actually good well let's talk about that then taking a look at the roster you say they're good where do you see the biggest weaknesses for the team this year um high-end skill um, like they really need like the first line scorer guy, the not necessarily as good as, but guys like McDavid, um, or like how we used to have Goudreau and Kachuk and Monahan, uh, Lindholm, like that the upper echelon guys. Like we do have some serviceable players, but we don't have any truly high high end guys right now, and. Everywhere else, though, I think that the Flames are fairly good. Uh, their defense is okay. Um, they could use another good defenseman or two, but that, uh, again, for where we are, for, everything's for, fine. And for where they are in this, you know, rebuild, retool cycle, I think the defense is okay. Like, is it going to take you to the Stanley Cup? No, but it's not designed to. No, and, like, realistically, like, this is a team that profiles to be a bottom 10 team. And, yeah. you know, not necessarily like bottom four or five, like this Sharks level bad, but, you know, like we're not going to win a ton of hockey games this year. And, you know, when you don't have a ton of skill, your goaltending is, you know, you're, you've got a rookie goaltender with a backup who hasn't had a full season as a starter. Um, you know, like, and the defense core as it is, like, you're, you've got enough weaknesses, like, where this team on the whole should not be very good. Um, it, they could surprise and push for a playoff spot, but the, basically everything would have to go right in that case. But, like, when you're talking about the D being weak, and I agree, like, I think that's one of the issues we're going to see. But when we look at, okay, who could solve that? We've got, Jeremy Poirier, we've got Hunter Burstavich, we've got, you know, Ilya Soloviev. Like the Flames have the pieces that need some maturing in the American League, but help is on the way. Oh, yeah, for sure. And uh, as much as like we have placeholders up front, we have plenty of placeholders on the blue line. And got, having a guy like Tyson Berry and Jake Bean and uh, Plahal and Mirmanov, like all of those guys are basically designed to be tradable pieces if necessary and yep. you know and especially at, at the trade deadline like if guys like Poirier and Brustavich say are playing so good in the AHL that you want them up at the end of the year that gives you carte blanche to move on from some of those other guys and you know change things up yeah it gives options for sure I think in the context of where the Flames are at this year, again, not looking at a playoff roster or anything like that, I think their biggest issue is NHL centermen. Like, you know, they're expected to start Postel at center between Huberto and Mantha. I don't think Postel is a center. I don't think Zari is a center. So they've got Backland, Kadri, and Rooney. I think that's something that'll have to be addressed. Oh, yeah. And I think that you're only realistically going to solve that via the draft. And when you have. Like last year, the Flames' biggest weakness was organizationally was that we didn't really have very many defense prospects and young defensemen. And like Conroy went to task on getting like 10 guys to fill organizational spots uh, on the blue line. And so now that's actually one of our organizational strengths. And the only glaring weakness organizationally is center depth. And I think that like the prospects that we see in trade this year um, when we move on from certain guys or the draft picks themselves will be very center focused. I do believe. I agree. Like, I think, I think they'll need to find a way to solve it 
mid-season potentially because I don't think you want to keep Postel and Zari kind of rotating on that center spot. I think you might need a waiver pickup or something. But when I look at the centermen, you know, that are coming up, Sam Morton needs some time. Rory Cairns, I don't think, is the answer. Uh, Nikolaev, maybe, as your depth guy. And then, you know, Clark Bishop, no. Justin Kirkland, no. You've really got, and uh, Cole Schwint, I think of all those, is the closest guy. So, you know, I think Schwint could, could for what they have this year, could slot in if they need an extra centerman quickly. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I think you will see a centerman coming back in trade, in waiver, in something this year to, to fill one of those spots. Yeah, and even organizationally, like over the long term, you'll see, like, I would be shocked if the flames didn't go heavy in the draft over centers um you know like I, i'd be floored if like our first pick wasn't a center yeah uh, we got our year. we got our wingers we got our d-men got our goalie now we need our centers yeah and just and i wouldn't even be surprised if that's the case for like the next two or three drafts too yeah, but again, that's you know a three, four year solution. Like I think you'll see them do what they did for defense last year: pick up the Merrimanov equivalent of a center, pick up the Pahal equivalent of a center, pick up the Hamley equivalent of a center potentially, and just try to fill that spot and see if they can get something out of somebody. Yep. Um, and I mean, maybe that's Rooney, maybe it's not. But you know, for a for a team that is quote unquote rebuilding, we've it's good to have more bodies than we have spots for. Yes. You know, that's not something you see a lot. Usually these teams are struggling to even, you know, put, put 23 guys on a roster. For sure. Um, let's talk about the leadership this year. It's going to be different. Michael Backlund will continue to serve as captain. Every game he'll be joined by two individuals from a pool of five alternate captains, which is Rasmus Anderson and Mackenzie Weger, Jonathan Huberto, Blake Coleman, Nazem Kadri. We've seen in the past, you know, like the two at home, two on the road, that sort of thing. But now we have this group of five. I hate to be the equipment manager that has to switch the A every game and how they're going to pick that. But, you know, those are those are your leaders, right? Those are your veteran guys in this team. And I'm glad to see Huberto and Kadri in there because I think they're the, you know, the guys that have done this the longest. They're the guys that had the most success doing this. Um I, I like the group. I'm not sure how the rotation is going to work or how you make sure everyone's fair or even if they care, but interesting way to go. Yep. Nothing much we to all, say, like the kind of to be expected and the right guys were selected. Yeah. I mean, that that's the thing, right? It's it, it, you wouldn't have really picked anybody else. No, like there's really no other possible option here. I don't, you know, those are the guys that you need to be there. Well, you we'll you could have selected uh, Kuzmenko just to like harass everybody, but you know that that's about it. Yeah, I don't even know if that'd be harassment. Like he seems to be a, an interesting fellow. Yes. Um, you know, and I think everybody likes him, but I don't know that he's your leader. I don't know he's the guy that you know is going to say the right things in a tough time, that sort of thing. True. So I think you know, and, and these are all guys that all have more than one year too. I don't think you want Kuzmenko there and then he gets traded or something like that. Like these are all guys that are flames past this year, theoretically. Mm -hmm. And guys like, you know, um, Mackenzie Weger, guys like Huberto, guys like Kadri, who have decided to come to Calgary, right? Guys that committed their future here. And I think that's important right now for the team as well when you're looking at, you know, showing that this is a place we want to be and want to play. Yep. Well, Matt, with that, I guess the next thing is to jump into our season predictions game. You and I have had hot years. We've had cold years. I, I'm curious how we're going to yeah, do this Yeah, sometimes year. the crystal ball is a little murkier than we are used to, and you know, other times we're bang on. So It depends on how the team does and what their season looks like. So grab your microfiber cloth and polish up your crystal ball. It's time for the prediction game. So for those that don't know, Matt and I will make predictions. I think we've got uh, about... 20 things to predict this year we will make these predictions then we will look back at them at about the 40 game mark to see how we're doing at the at the middle of the season and then we'll look back at them at the end of the season last year you and i did not do well at all gee mild shock there like <laughs> the team um, really didn't either so well no but that, but that's it we expected more from the team last year and so we we didn't do great no all right you ready matt yes definitely who if anybody produces at more than a point per game pace Zero. 
You don't think anybody? Not a one. I'm going to say Andre Kuzmenko. I think this might be the year that he breaks out. I think he's finally in a market where he doesn't have a lot of expectation. I think he's in a market with a coach that is giving him a, a chance. I mean, if he is on our first line, I think you could see him. I don't, I'm not saying he'll get more than 82 points because I don't know if he'll be here for 82 games, but I think for the time he's aflame, he could get better than point per game. We will find out. Um, going to the defense, I think we've got Uyghur, Anderson, and Ball, who I think we can say are the top three. Do you think that either Mirmanov, Bean, or I guess Hanley or Pakal, one of those guys establishes themselves as a, as a top four, a legit top four? I guess I would uh, put Miramanov as the only guy that I could see elevating his game to that point. Maybe Tyson Berry, but uh, yeah, I I don't think he's... At 33, I don't think so. No. I'm going to go Miramanov as well. I think, like you said, that's the only guy. So maybe the question then should be, does Daniel Miramanov elevate himself to be a legit top four? Yeah. Uh, Let me change the question here. Since we both think it's Mermanov. Like the other guys are all fillers. Mermanov is he's still young enough that he could. Um and he was injured last year, so he didn't really he hasn't really played a lot. So he's a lot like uh, you know, almost like we were talking about with Peltier before. It's like let's see how this guy does when he's not hurt or when he has a full season. How many games do you think Dustin Wolf will start? I think uh 35 to 40 is about right. I said 35. I put that down before I asked you. I think we saw Dustin Wolf with some chinks in the armor last year. I remember San Jose game where he didn't look all that good. And I don't think there's any reason to overplay this guy. The Flames are not expected to be a great team. You don't need him to carry you to the playoffs. I still think they need to see what they have in Dan Vladar. I think that 35 starts, not necessarily 35 total appearances, but 35 starts seems about right for him. Yep. So, yeah, I'm I'm with you. 35. I think if you play him in more than 40, you probably overplayed him for his first year. Yeah. How many does Dan Vladar start? Uh, 45. So you think he will really play more games than Wolf this year? Yes. Okay. I'm going to say... The the de facto starter-ish... But, you know, uh, I think that it's going to be a 1A, 1B. Um, And you might see Cooley getting a few games in there if injuries happen. But goalie injuries are so hard to predict because sometimes you go a whole year without them. Other times one guy's missing for like two months. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to say that uh, Wolf starts 35, Vladar starts 40. I think you'll see Vladar start a few more. On like in the past, the Flames of Suns played their starter back to back. I don't think you see that this year. I think you'll see Vladar get some minutes against maybe some some uh, you know teams that have more experience, and that gives us seventy five games, which means I'll leave seven games for Cooley or somebody else, which yeah. I think is reasonable. And and like you said, I mean we don't even know if Vladar is going to hold up. I mean he's had some injury issues there, so that'll be part of the I guess the story of the season too is. Is, can Dan Vladar play? He's looked great in the preseason, but you know, can he do this? The next question, Matt, I'm gonna make a I'm gonna make an assumption. You tell me if I'm right. I think that last year both Zari and Postel were not the guys we expect to be the first call-ups. They were sort of surprises to make this team as regulars. Do you think that we have another guy who's not that top call-up who gets brought in and becomes that surprise regular from the from the AHL? Well, I'm going to qualify this that, it, you know, the, the two guys that made the team out of camp, Hanzig and Klapka, uh, nobody had them on the rod, you know, on the radar for them making the team out of camp. And... Uh, you know, I would count those two guys as my picks, even though they are actually making the team right off the hop. Because uh, I, I feel that both of those guys were expected to start in the AHL and, like, earn their way up like Zari and Pospisil did. But, you know, uh, them playing as good as they have, like, you kind of have to go with that. Yeah, I'd have to I'd have to go back to last year and remember, like, did Zari and Pospisil look as good in preseason as these guys yes. did? Yes, they did. Okay. 
Like a lot of, yeah. I remember a lot of people were somewhat surprised that the Flames didn't let Zari or Pospisil start the year. But then, like, it, it was less than a month into the year. I think it was on, like, the 26th or 27th of October that they got recalled and then stayed the rest of the year. And I think a big part of the, I mean, that was a perfect storm in a way, too. I think that, you know, Peltier was out, so they needed somebody else to come in. Like, I don't know that if Peltier was healthy, those guys would have been the first call up there. Um, what do we want to say, I guess, being an NHL regular? How many games do we want to qualify this with? 60. 60. Okay. So you got to play way more than half. Yeah. Um, all right. I think Hansig and Klapka is a good one. I'm going to go a little bit different. I'm going to say Coronado, who I think will probably come up at some point. And I don't think it's going to be a D-man. Um, I think I'll say, I'll leave it to Coronado. I think Klapka, if he starts here, yeah, probably makes the roster. I, I don't know if that's a surprise. We'll see. Because he was on the bubble last year, too. Um, and he had some NHL time last year. So, yeah, we'll say Coronado for me, Hansig, and Klapka for you. Yep. Who has a breakout season? Hmm. Or does anybody have a breakout season? I guess by breakout, we could say, I don't know, what are we going to want to qualify that? Like their best season or the season where they make the most improvement? I'm going to have to go with uh, Connor Zari. I think he's going to establish himself as a true top six forward. Okay. Um, By the number of points these yes, scores? Or? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I view it as like somebody who uh, like takes their game to the next level. And I think that uh, Zari, I, you know, I, I felt that like he was like a good middle six forward. I think that he's going to push himself up in the lineup even further. I think that's fair. I'm going to go a little bit different. I'm going to say Kevin Ball. Yep. I think Kevin Ball, this will be the year potentially that he establishes himself as a real... I mean, we talked about Miramanov. I think Kevin Ball was brought in here to be a top three, so he wouldn't be a surprise if he got there. But I'm going to say that I think that Kevin Ball really established himself as a guy who is coming in here and is ready to you know, to take that role. Hmm. And I think this could be his breakout season. Who's going to struggle this year? Number 10. Is that a surprise at this point? Like, okay, I guess at this point for Huberto to struggle, what does that mean? Uh, I think he gets even fewer points than he did last year and just... Wow, yeah. okay. Why do you think that? I... He looked invisible during the preseason for long stretches. Like, he had one good game in Edmonton when he was playing against uh, some... Well, it's Edmonton. <laughs> you know, and... Like, he had the one good deflection in the last preseason game, but the rest of the time, he made very bad passes, looked, his skating looked sluggish, it, just like his whole game looked terrible, frankly. And, you know, uh, like, uh, honestly, he looked about as bad as Mantha did. And, like, Mantha's kind of like your fill-in third-line guy who can score occasionally, and... You know, like it's bad that the the Flames are have him under contract for another six years after this one. Like it's, you know, you and I have talked about this off the show. I think we've probably talked about it at some point on the show too. But that ten million really doesn't look all that bad right now. No, like realistically, like this team needs to hit the cap floor, and it's perfectly fine. It's just. But even, yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, this is the time to chew up those years when you're not needing to use that to bring in a really top guy. No, and realistically, like, in a couple of years, uh, like, the CBA is up, and, uh, you know, I would not be surprised because usually after every CBA, there's compliance buyouts. I would not be shocked if that's the case, frankly. Um, it, it's He needs to show that he's an actual NHL player still and like a top six forward and you know like if basing it on the preseason that i watched i would not call him that at this point and you know like i'm very concerned about his actual nhl future at this point uh because like he's really falling off a cliff i'm trying to look does he have no movement could we wave him 
I mean, you got to pay him anyways. <laughs> Whatever letter he's wearing on the front doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, I, I think he has a full no move, so you couldn't. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go same line, other side. I think Anthony Mantha is going to be a disappointment. I don't think he comes in because I think Mantha's success is based on Huberto's success. And if, if you don't think Huberto is going to do well, I don't think Mantha is going to do well. And I'm going to qualify that. He got, Mantha got 44 points by two teams last year, 34 and 10. I'm going to say that he gets less than 25 points and nets the Flames, um, uh, probably a middle pick as a return. Like, I think he's not going to do well and he's not going to net as much as they thought. Mm-hmm. I thought we all kind of thought Mantha will probably get a second or third in return. Is that fair? Yeah. If he, he plays like he did last year, a second round pick is probably about right. So if we were to say that he'll get them, say, a third to fifth round pick. Yeah. I, I, like I Yeah, I would expect like a fourth or a fifth. If he okay. he gives gets like 25 points yeah we'll see but i think math is going to look less than stellar this year who will pleasantly surprise i'm gonna go with um klapka actually i think he will become like what pospisil was for this team last year i think that like that crash and bang and can generate some offense and just create havoc generally. I think that like he's going to become a f- fan favorite. I'm going to go one of two ways on this. I think one could be Kuzmenko, and he survives us by doing really well and signing a deal, a new deal. The other one I'm going to say is Matt Coronado. I think you might see Matt Coronado recalled sooner rather than later and establish himself as a as an everyday top six NHLer. I think, to me, that would be a, a nice surprise for him this year. Who will be the top point getter for the Flames this year? I'm going to have to go with Kuzi. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, It to me, like, it was between him and Kadri, and I was going to say Kadri just because I think that on that line, like, I think Kuzmenko could get the most goals, but I think Kadri could easily set up Sharon Govich and Kuzmenko. Yeah, it's one of those that's going to be either or, and I I feel that they're going to be within like five to eight points of each other at the end of the year. I feel like my answer should be, all right, I'm going to change it. I think it'll be Sharon Govich. Well, he's he's hurt, though, to start the year. So he. Yeah, but we don't know how hurt. True. So I'm going to go Sharon Govich on that. Like, I feel like with a new five-year deal, it's not like he's out all season. I doubt he'll be out for a month or two, but I feel like he should be that guy. And you know what? As much as he's hurt, I mean, Kadri's getting older. He, you know, he has just as much likelihood to get hurt, that sort of thing. Yep. All right. Who will be the first flame traded? You and I never get this one right. Uh, I'll go with Tyson Berry. Really? Yep. D-men generally tend to get traded sooner than later, uh, like in January and February. But remember last year we traded our forward before our D-man. No, we didn't. First we, we traded Zadora first. Oh, okay. If you look at it that way, I guess I was thinking like the other guys. Yeah. But yeah, Lindholm was was really the first big guy out the door. Yeah. Where is Zadora now? I don't even know. Um, I think he's still with Vancouver, but I'm not okay. sure. I don't think he... Yeah, oh, no, he signed with think, Boston. That's right, because he didn't want to be there. Yeah. I'm going to say Mantha. I think Mantha... We'll probably get moved first, but yeah, I, I could see Barry. I don't know. I, I think the Flames might want to hang on to Barry a little bit longer. I think, but I think that's very viable as well. We'll see. We'll probably both get this wrong and it'll be somebody completely off the board. Yeah. Here's a harder question and we'll talk, I think, more about this as the season goes on. There's been a lot of talk of, is this the year to trade Rasmus Anderson? Do you think that Rasmus Anderson gets dealt before the trade yes. deadline this year? Yes. And I think... Um the reason for that is he's on such a good contract and uh, he still has one more year after this. And realistically, he, he will be the best player available at the deadline, period. And teams like his competitiveness, the fact that he can get 50 points, the fact that he can hit you know, and play excellent defensively, uh, you know, unless he specifically requests not to be traded, I would assume, you know, like he's like, I want to sign like a long term contract with you. Uh, 
I would assume that he would get traded at the deadline. He has two years left at four point five million a year, and he has a six team no trade list. So it does still leave the Flames the ability to move him to quite a few teams if they wanted to. I'm gonna say no. I think that he stays here for this year, and I think that that might be a big off season piece to to move him. Um, I don't know that they're. I don't know that the deal will be there to do it yet. Yeah, and it, uh, it all is depends on Rasmus's. Uh, desire to stay here like if he actually wants to stay here and he would communicate that with the management group but if he's at all like Hannafin and Tanev and Lindholm and Zadorov last year it you know like it, you might as well just move on and like if you don't want to be here just you know cash out the asset and like yeah and I could also see him saying let's see how the season goes and then in you know July 1st toss him a new offer and he's not interested he goes on the block something like that yeah, and like you're not going to get less for him if you wait a year, uh, but it just depends on like you know if you're wanting to make room for the, the Bruce Davich, the Parek, the you know Poirier. Well, you know. Yeah, I mean I think you can make room for those guys pretty easily too. You, yes, you move on from Hanley, you move on from Barry, you move on from you know Pakal. Yeah, any of those um, guys, yes, for sure. I, I think we might. I think Anderson is going to be a lot like we saw with Markstrom, where there was deals talked about and floated around, and they just didn't get done until the off season. Yeah, like I think that's going to be a big acquisition for both teams, and I think there might be some holdups to get some of that done. Yeah, because realistically, in a trade with for Anderson, like you're going to get three really good assets back, and like typically, like a first round pick, a center prospect that's good. And, you know, potentially like a second round pick or an additional first. Or uh, even a roster center. Yeah. So, like, you know, that's where it's, you know, with the agent stage of the team and like having guys like Parekh in the chamber, you know, moving on is not necessarily the worst thing either because you're going to be getting a ton more assets to then, you know, you yeah. know, draft your next center and like all those kind of things. And, I mean, we talked about the, the alternate captains earlier. I think it is a little su suspect that the Flames have five alternates. Like, it's just a weird number. And I wouldn't be surprised if, when I saw Anderson on the list, I kind of thought in my head, oh, maybe he moves on. And that's why, you know, they kind of got five for now. I'm going to say that Anderson does not move, get traded this year. And by this year, we'll say before the deadline. Do you think the Flames will move another non-expiring veteran contract? So the expiring contracts this year are Kuzmenko, Mantha, Rooney, Barry, and Hanley, and also Vladar. Yeah, I think that you won't see any of the longer-term people, barring um, Anderson, getting moved. I don't think so either. I think this time next year, you and I might be having the conversation of, do you move the captain? Yeah. But I don't think that happens any time this year. Yeah. No, and that and and in that particular case, it's like you you sit down with Backlund and say, "What team do you want to try to win a cup with?" And you know, you pick the team, and we'll get a deal done. Not so much, uh, you know, get the best assets necessarily. Like, what do you, who do you feel like you might win a cup with? Okay, we'll trade you to that team. Yeah. So I'm just checking here while we're talking about him. Huberto has a, he cannot be traded, sent to the minors or waived without permission. So yeah, they couldn't even put a W on his chest if they wanted to. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I think, I mean, we'll talk about Backlund next year, but I don't, I don't see any other long-term veteran here. I don't think you're trading Uyghur. Like I think Uyghur is an interesting option for a team and still had a pretty good deal, but I don't think anybody wants to take on that deal until 2031. Um, there's really no other real contract here that I think a team's really going to want to take on. I mean, even Kadri until 2029, I don't think a team would want to take that much money for that long. Yeah. You're not moving, you're not moving Sharon Govich. Lomberg's too expensive to move. Like, you know, Postel and Zari don't get moved. There's really no other veteran that makes sense this year. Yeah. And realistically, you know, like with Uyghur, he's basically taking uh, Giordano's role from the previous rebuild where he, he's establishing himself as the number one guy for this team as we're, we are doing the transition. And, like, you still need veteran guys who are actually really good to get guys that come up like Parak, like Brustavich, to learn from as well. For sure. And, 
he's fitting the bill 100%. Yeah, I think you keep him here for sure. All right, here's the question that we ask every year and we've had marginal success on. Who will be the first call-up for forward defense? We won't put goalie in there because there's really only one option for goalie. I don't see any way. Yeah, that you're not going to call somebody like gets Nat called up. unless like we have like three different goalies hurt. Yeah, but even then, he's not going to be the first call-up. Like if we're that if we're that screwed, that'd be like the year that we had to go out. Remember the year we used like ten goalies? And yeah, found Tyrone Gardner again? and yeah, yeah, like all those guys and Moss. Yeah. So who's your first forward called up? Mine's uh, Coronado. Yeah, I would go with Coronado as well. And I would go with Bruce Davich on the blue line. Really? No. Oh. Okay, I'm going to say Soloviev is the first guy to be called up on the blue line. Because I think that if you're calling up a guy early, you're going to want someone that you know is close. And I don't know that that's Bristavich yet, but we'll see. I, I was debating between Soloviev and Poirier. I think one of those two is going to be the first call up. Yeah, and I'm kind of viewing because the Flames have eight defensemen that we won't need a call up until like the trade deadline ish, and so that's where I'm like, yeah. Oh. The only the only way I can see a call up there is if one of those guys gets hurt and they're going on a long road trip. They often like to carry an extra D man. Yeah. So it, you know they might not they might not get into a game a lot, but you know I could see a guy like Soloviev come up or you know Poirier come up go on the trip with them. Yeah, and realistically, I view uh, Bruce Stavich as the closest in terms of being a complete NHL defenseman, not just a defensive defender like Soloviev. Um, yeah, I, I get that. I just think that especially with Soloviev and Poirier, they're close, and you got to kind of see what they've got. Yeah. You don't even see that with Bruce Stavich yet. True. Do the Flames win the Battle of Alberta? Um, are you meaning a game or... <laughs> the whole, the overall battle. No. Weird thing. The Oilers only come here once this year. Yep. What a weird schedule. Yes, and we'll be coincidentally hosting a live show during that game. That's right. We'll talk more about that in a little bit here. I don't think there's any way. It pains me to say as a Flames fan, there's no way they win this year. No. Edmonton's going to be good. Calgary's not. Calgary doesn't win the Battle of Alberta. Though if anybody's coming, well, when we talk about our live show earlier, our trivia night... Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Here's a hint. Calgary's ahead in the Battle of Alberta overall. Yep. But this year, I, I don't think that Calgary wins. There's, what, uh, three games, I think? So Yeah. Yeah, I don't think Calgary will win, uh, win that one. Where do the Flames finish in the regular season in the Pacific Division? Sixth. Only ahead of the Sharks and the Ducks because those two teams are still, like, two of the three worst teams in the NHL. So for those that don't know all the teams, let's go through all the teams in the Pacific Division. So it's the Ducks, the Flames, the Oilers, the Kings, the Sharks, the Kraken, the Canucks, the Golden Knights. So that's what, eight teams? Yep. So you think you think they'll be sixth? Yep. Finishing up at, at only ahead of uh, those two teams, the Ducks and the Sharks. It's tough for me. I don't know. How, I think the Kings are going to take a step back. I think Seattle's going to take a step forward. I'm going to say fifth. I think they they could end up, and this is a very veteran-laden team. It sounds like they want to compete. I think they could end up going out and trying to surprise people. Yeah, I just uh, don't see uh, them. Like, the the Kraken are better than the Flames, uh, I view. And I th feel that the Kings are actually on the upswing still. Um, so... You know, like it, it it's a, a, not the toughest division, but it's like there are lots of good middle teams, and I just view that the Flames are below the middle teams. I think it's going to depend a lot on like last year, Blake Coleman came out of nowhere and surprised and got a ton of points. I think if you get some veterans that come out and play like that this year, this team yeah. could surprise. Well, like people. for example, like if Huberdo bounces back and is even remotely close to Florida Huberdo. Yeah, uh, I you think know, if, then, you know, if like Kuzmenko this, or Sharon Govich can get a point a game. Yeah, like if the veterans play well, like this team could squeak into a playoff spot. It's just the likeliness of that happening is kind of on the, yeah, yeah not so much side no, of things. And I'm, I'm not even saying a playoff spot, but I think, you know, fifth and sixth are far from the playoffs. True, but yeah, like even in the conversation of playoffs, I don't view them as that in that 
conversation at all. All right. Well, that was going to be my next question. Will slash should the Flames be a legitimate playoff contender this year? You and I were talking for the show. I, the Flames have two or three uh, draft picks in the first round. I'm still confused by this Montreal pick. It's the most convoluted set of conditions I've ever seen. Yeah. That one that the Flames and and did with Montreal with the Monahan deal, but they've potentially got theirs. They've got um, they've got Florida's and they've got uh, New Jersey's. Yeah, and basically, if uh, both the Flames and the Panthers finish in the bottom ten. Then uh, the pick gets deferred to next year, and the Flames won't have their first round pick. But the Florida Panthers, fresh off the Stanley Cup, uh, winning it and all of that, they're not going to be a bottom 10 team this year. So realistically, the Florida draft pick will transfer to Montreal, and it provided that the Flames finish in the bottom 10, which I would be somewhat shocked if they didn't. I mean, it's definitely nice to be lottery protected, but I I would hate to have been the guy at the league that had to come up to that do his trade call and you know figure all this stuff out. Here's the, the here's the textbook. We'll just throw it at you. You figure it out. We'll here you go. <laughs> all right, guys. You you know what you're doing. You just tell us who gets what pick when. Yeah. At some point, somebody's picks got to go to somebody else. You gentlemen, figure it out. Yeah. It's a good thing Conroy was AGM at that point, so he has some idea of what the heck they were doing now that it's his pick. Um, I'm going to say the Flames... I have mixed feelings on this. Should they be a playoff contender? I I don't know now is the time. Like, Would I be upset? No. I hate the idea of tanking. I have never liked this idea of let's tank for a better pick. I want them to be competitive. But I don't think that with the Pacific Division this year that they're going to be anywhere close to a playoff spot. And I wouldn't want them to deviate course to make it happen. No. And realistically, like the more important thing for this team is to play hard and let the prospects do their thing. And, you know, if they play their way onto the team, great. And capitalize on assets just like they did last year at the trade deadline and you know keep the drier tumbling so to speak of just folding assets over folding assets and you know keep getting more draft picks and you know let the team grow organically because realistically it's the matt vagradines the andrew bashas the uh, so, uh, Sunayevs, the Pereks, the Brustaviches that are going to make this team good. Not, you know, Kevin Rooney and, you know, Huberto and Kadri. Like, as much as it sucks, like, those guys are kind of placeholders until the next wave comes in. And, like, those guys are still in juniors or just starting in the AHL. You know, they're not NHL ready yet. And,. At the same time, if this group of guys can find a way to sneak in, I think you've got to let them do it. Like, I don't oh, want yeah. them to cut their knees off at the deadline to, you know, sort of quote unquote tank and get a better pick. If there's enough young guys, enough veterans that can will that can will this team into the playoffs, I think we as fans have to say, you know what, let's ride it and see how far you can go. And for those young guys, a playoff appearance is part of the development. And honestly, I'm of the opposite opinion. Like, unless the Flames are firmly in a playoff spot at the trade deadline and say, like, a guy like Kuzmenko is not signed, you move on regardless. And I think you definitely move guys like Kuzmenko, but I wouldn't start, say, moving, you know, let's say other players out. Like, even if they move Kuzmenko and they can still do it. Or, you know, they move Kuzmenko and, you know, let's say a guy like uh, Peltier or Coronado comes in and can still do it. I don't think you go out and try to move other players, maybe longer term pieces. Like, you know, if Anderson wasn't moved to that point, they weren't planning on it. I wouldn't move him just to tank the team. True. You know, so I think, yeah, you. that's what I'm saying. Don't alter the course of the season. Yeah, just keep the game plan as it is. But if in the regular course of the season, these guys can do it, I think you've got to give them the runway to give it a try. For sure. Because really, what's going to be the difference between, I mean, even if they're out first, I don't know that this year, and I haven't looked at the draft class, but from what I've heard early, I don't know that, you know, 10th pick and 15th or 18th pick is going to be all that different. No. And realistically, like, if we're picking 15th or 18th, we lose that pick anyway. Yeah. Uh, But at the end of the day, like, if the Flames are, say, picking um, with New Jersey and uh, 
Florida's draft pick instead of our own because we made the playoffs, it's like, oh well. But, you know, it, ideal situation is that we just move on from the Florida pick and we have our top 10 and all that. Last question for you, Matt. What do the Flames need to do for us to look back and say this was a successful season? Um, making way for young players to take those next steps, whether it's prime minutes in the AHL. Um, we already have seen part of that with moving guys like Parekh and the other draft picks back to their junior teams. You know, just fostering the making each player be successful in the situation that they're in. So that way this team can move forward. And whether that's, you know, like keeping guys up uh, all year, like say Hanzig and Klapka, if they show that they can, or returning them to the AHL if they hit the wall after game five. You know, whatever it takes for the player development side of it to be the key, that's the important thing. Yeah, I don't. I don't think we can put this down as a quantifiable piece, but I said something similar. I said we need to see our young players establish themselves and progress forward. I think the guys that are on the roster, whether that's the current guys or the guys that are here you know, at the end of the year, need to have established themselves as earning that spot and taking a step forward. And if they're like Peltier, I mean, we talked about that. If you're not looking good, then we need to move on from you. Cole Schwint, we talked about. You know, If he can't take that step forward then we need to make way for somebody else, whether it means moving him or just saying, you know what, you were, let's say, the top center in the AHL, we need to put someone else there. Like, I think we just need to, we need to move forward with all these guys' development. Yeah, and, and, you know, if it turns out that they make the playoffs, hey, that's an awesome bonus, just like the Flames in 2014, 2015. Things like that do happen. Is that the end goal? Not really. Um, and in a way that can actually hamper your development. Cause like, Oh, we should be a playoff team now. And you know, that tends to halt thing, you know, the proper progression of teams. Cause you know, then your expectations are raised and, 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 and again, I think as long as they didn't change their course, like remember a couple of years ago when true living went out and spent stupid assets on like Cali yarn croak, trying to build for a playoff spot. Like, don't do that. Don't not move a guy because we might make it the plus. But if in the course of regular business, we do yeah, better than we're to. expected. That's perfect. And, and I think that says something then about your young guys too, that, wow, these guys, you know, maybe it's Huberto. If he turns around and takes to a playoff, great. You want to foster that. You want to support that. Oh, yeah. It's just, you know, uh, the end results on paper of the team is less important. Yeah. Maybe some foolish GM, if, you know, Huberto took his on his back to the second round, would want him. And we could, you know, find him a new home. Like, you know, I think there's nothing, as long as they don't change the course, I don't think the draft pick is going to change all that much where they should not encourage it. Yes, exactly. Well, Matt, that's the end of the questions that I want us to predict. So we'll come back to those at Christmas or around Christmas time at the 40 game mark. We'll come back to those at the end of the season and see how we did. I think it's going to be, uh, I think it's going to be a mixed bag this year Yep, for how we did. We want to promote for our fans, just letting everyone know we told you to save the date last week. We have some more details, and you'll be able to find the details on our website at firesidechat.ca and our social media by the time you hear this if you want more details. But on November 3rd, we're partnering with our friends at Bow River Brewing again. During the Battle of Alberta game, the Flames and Oilers play that night at 6 p.m. Mountain Time to host Battle of Alberta Trivia. So we're not going to be doing a live podcast episode, but we'll be there. Matt will be there. I'll be there. And we'll be hosting Battle of Alberta Trivia. We'll have one game played during each intermission, so we'll play during the first. Then we'll play again during the second. We'll wipe the points clean, and we'll start again in the second in the second intermission. Each person or team that wins the intermission will get some free beer from Bow River, and then the two period winners will face off in the third for a grand prize pack. We'd love to see everybody there. We all had a ton of fun when we hung out during the draft there. Great beer, great food, fun atmosphere. Come on out if you don't have tickets to the Battle of Alberta game and come play trivia. We're letting you know about this now so you can start to brush up on your Battle of Alberta trivia between now and the 3rd of November. And we'll continue to remind this, or remind you of this as we move forward. But Matt and I would love to see everybody there. Matt, last trivia game we played was a, was a great time. Yep. I, we we I, all had fun. It was a lot of fun. And it was nice to get a bunch of people involved in it and 
you know, it was an actual contest instead of, you know, like, oh, there's two people here and, well, somebody gets a prize type of thing. Yeah. And you know what? I mean, we had people that weren't that great, but they were able to partner with other people. I think we had one team that sort of formed in impromptu on the spot. And, you know, it's just a great way to come hang out with Flames fans, meet some people, have some beer, watch the Flames, hopefully beat the Oilers at home. And uh, it should be a lot of fun. So brush up on your Battle of Alberta trivia and mark November 3rd on your calendar to see us at Bow River Brewing's Tap House. Matt, it's time for another tradition of ours now every season, and that's our weekly predictions. Last year, I beat you. Um, I beat you most years. Are you ready to get started with this again? Yeah, I was surprised two years ago when I actually won that one. Um, yeah, uh, so... Countdown. You're still remembering it two yes. years later. Yes. That's how meaningful it was. Is it on your resume, the one year that you won the weekly prediction exactly. game? Exactly. There you go. Did you submit that when you were going for Conroy's job when it was vacant? <laughs> All right, we got three games coming up this week. Obviously, the Flames start their season on Wednesday the 9th, an 8 p.m. start time in Vancouver against the Canucks. Then their home opener, the weirdest home opener I can remember, on Saturday the 12th, 8 p.m. against the Philadelphia Flyers. Like, usually we take on a team people care about, but they got the Flyers this year. And then a back-to-back there on the 13th, they make a short trip up to Edmonton, a 6 p.m. start time for the first game of the Battle of Alberta. Three games, Matt, what are your predictions? I will go with zero points. You think they lose all three? Yes. We always lose the first game of the season for whatever reason. We usually lose the home opener, and then we're playing in Edmonton on the second day of a back-to-back. I'm going to say it's going to be 0 for 3. Who do you put in net for each game? Uh, Vladar for the first one, Wolf for the second, and Vladar for the third. Feels to me like we have to beat Philly. Like, this is not a good team. We have to beat them at home. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they actually push for a playoff spot this year. Yeah? Who's their goalie this year now that Hart's not there? Uh, it's I cannot remember. It's some prospect guy, but he, he was good last okay, year. You know, every backup tries to earn their way to the starting job. This guy just got it handed to him. Samuel Erson. Yeah, that, that was a... Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a little bit less pessimistic than you. I'm going to say they beat Philly. They they lose to Edmonton and Vancouver. Yeah. That's my hope. They don't have a good track record of winning the home opener, but I'm hoping on uh, Thanksgiving weekend everyone will be ready, they'll be pumped, and the Flyers will be a team they can beat. I think, I think they'll drop that first one. I think that'll give them some motivation for the second one. But a back-to-back with, you know, at least Edmonton's not far to go. But I, I think they'll drop that Edmonton game. Yeah. So, Matt, we will uh, talk to you next week and see how we did. But it's good to have hockey back, isn't it? Uh, it's been a long time. <laughs> it has been. I'm excited for this season. And while I know there's going to be some bumps in the road for this team, I think it's going to be a, a really interesting year for the Calgary Flames. Yep. And lots to look forward to. And as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.